Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Police have released the identity of a suspect behind a shooting at Michigan State University, which left three people dead and five others wounded. We have an exclusive interview with a former U.S. Drug Enforcement agent who explains how cartels are lacing their drugs with a substance that's killing so many. And the Conservatives brought forth a motion demanding the Trudeau government do more to fight inflation. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Lethbridge EMS say a man died following a house fire Monday afternoon along the 800 block of 27th Street North. Fire crews from three stations arrived to discover smoke coming from the building with a fire on the main floor. Once the blaze was put out, firefighters found a man inside of the home dead. Police say the death is not criminal in nature and damage to the home is estimated at $200,000. The investigation into the fire continues. Police have identified the 43-year-old suspect behind a deadly shooting at Michigan State University on Monday night. They say Anthony McRae opened fire inside of an academic building and the student union, killing three students and injuring five others. Police confronted McRae off campus before he allegedly killed himself. Received multiple 911 calls of a shooting inside Berkey Hall. Numerous officers responded. We were quickly on scene within minutes. And there we did locate uh, several victims of a shooting. The incident did move to a building in close proximity, the Michigan State University Union Building, where there was another report of a shooting immediately following the first incident. The motive for the shooting remains unclear as the alleged shooter McRae had no affiliation with the university. Several Ottawa residents returned home from work Monday night to find their homes destroyed. Ottawa emergency responders were on the scene following an explosion in the Orleans area that injured 12 people and displaced many others from their homes. Ottawa fire services say the investigation is ongoing. So just an update on the total number of patients we have now is 12. Um, we have transported two in serious but stable condition, and we've transported three others in stable condition to the hospital, and the remaining seven were assessed by paramedics on site and refused transport. What I can tell you is that the Ottawa police are remaining on scene. We are controlling the, the scene perimeter. Uh, we are working right now with the uh, Ontario Fire Marshal's office as well as the Ministry of Labor as the investigation continues. It's very early stages. Uh, we're still securing everything uh, within the frameworks, and once that has been confirmed, then the investigation is going to continue. Conservative MPs discussed their party's motion calling on the federal government to address inflation and the high cost of living. The Tories see under Justin Trudeau's leadership, Canadians have never had it so bad. They say many people are hurting. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, Canadians are hit with 40-year highs in inflation, food inflation, Rents have doubled, mortgages have doubled, house prices have doubled across this country. They've increased their carbon tax and they will triple, triple, triple their failed carbon tax that has done nothing for the environment and only give Canadians more pain. We've seen $15 billion in cushy contracts going to Liberal insiders. That's money that could have went back to Canadians or stayed in their pockets. This government's agenda of taxing as much as they can on Canadians, taking more and more from Canadians, we're leaving less in their pocket, is an agenda that's hurting Canadians all across this country. The mayor of Archipelago is sounding the alarm about Canada's fresh water. Bert Liverance was joined by U.S. representatives calling on the Canadian government to do more to protect our Great Lakes. That includes Ottawa's $1 billion commitment to ensure the lake's long-term sustainability. Liverin says so many rely on the lakes for their clean drinking water. Our proximity to fresh water is what makes Georgian Bay a world-class destination. We want to make sure it stays that way. Preserving source water quality is a shared concern among local elected leaders across the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin. Our residents in the archipelago drink the fresh water directly from the bay which makes it vitally important that the water is potable. Sadly, 
By the time the fresh water of Great Lakes reaches the Atlantic Ocean from the St. Lawrence, it is undrinkable. Only by investing in and protecting this resource will we be able to continue delivering clean, safe, and affordable fresh water to our communities and residents and sustain the blue economy on which our waterfront communities and local industries thrive. Well, it's been kind of a cool Valentine's Day so far across much of southwestern Alberta, but fortunately the mercury will be climbing. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early look at the forecast. Jeanette, a lot of the snow that recently arrived will begin to melt soon, just like our hearts melting on the special day. Yeah, and your heart might melt a little more when you see the forecast for the next week, too, as we are headed back into the pluses now for at least the next week or so. Now, we were supposed to see more flurries today. We did not. Most of the snow should be gone now. We are expecting an overnight low of minus 12. Uh, that's a little lower than what we have been experiencing lately, but into tomorrow, Wednesday, we're going to see lots of sunshine. High of zero, uh, that along with a 40 kilometer per hour wind from the west. After that, though, we're going to be on the other side of the mercury the plus side and I'll be back later in the show to give you that seven day forecast. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. NORAD's failure to keep track of a mysterious object that flew over both Canadian and U.S. airspace is evidence that it is in need of an upgrade. Now that's according to one U.S. security expert who says that just one example of why the shared continental defense system needs an overhaul. Jamil Jaffer, executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University, says the fact that NORAD lost sight of the object over Montana before it later appeared over Wisconsin suggests a lack of capability, a lack of attention, or even a combination of both. Defense Minister Anita Nad is in Brussels meeting with NATO defense ministers. and Nad says Canada's support for Ukraine and its war with Russia is unwavering. She also says the Canadian military is continuing efforts to recover the unidentified aerial object that was shot down over the Yukon. We are continuing to search for the debris in central Yukon. We have deployed a number of aircraft to assist in that recovery effort. I want to indicate that the terrain is extremely rugged, it is extremely remote, the temperature is approximately minus 25 degrees Celsius there, and there is heavy snow. So the recovery effort is difficult. As Russia increases its attacks in Ukraine's southern and eastern corridors, soldiers defending the front line say they urgently need more ammunition and planes to be able to win the war. Нам потрібна також авіація, ракети. І для того, щоб наші військові не гинули, так як зараз це відбувається. Now here is more dramatic footage of rescuers working to save lives in Turkey following last week's devastating earthquake which killed more than 33,000 people. Rescuers in Turkey pulled a man from under the rubble on Tuesday, almost 200 hours after the 7.8 magnitude quake. Meanwhile, in Syria, efforts to help survivors were marred by the divisions from 12 years of civil war. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has announced her plans to run for U.S. president, challenging former President Donald Trump. She delivered her announcement via a tweeted video. It's a move that marks an about face for the ex-Trump cabinet official, who two years ago said she would not challenge her former boss for the White House in 2024. Haley cited the country's economic troubles and the need for generational change, a shot at 76-year-old Trump's age. The 51-year-old is the first in a long line of Republicans who are expected to launch 2024 campaigns in the coming months. A tweeted video from Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is drawing backlash from various Indigenous groups. Smith's video, which was published on Twitter last Friday morning, claimed Indigenous peoples and settlers are united to tame an unforgiving frontier to ensure the prosperity of future generations. University of Manitoba Indigenous history scholar Sean Carleton says Smith's framing of the history of Canada's relationship to Indigenous people reflects a concerning lack of understanding. Smith was asked to apologize for the comments during her call-in radio show over the weekend. She responded that Alberta has been a pioneer in its relationship with First Nations, but noted there's a long history of not living up to commitments outlined in the treaties. 
You know, every year on this day, many cities across the country hold walks in memory of indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people who were either missing or have been murdered. In our city, around 4,000 red flags have been placed at City Hall to bring awareness to the estimated number of how many women and girls are missing. The city of Lethbridge adopted the national inquiry with regards to MMIWG. And here in the city's work plan, they're recognizing that we can provide local action in recognition of the symbolic nature, but also the hugely important challenges faced by many of the families who are dealing with losses of murdered Indigenous persons across Canada. An organizer of today's event says Lethbridge has been holding similar walks for over 16 years now, and the message has not changed. When they come out and they say, hey, our family members are missing, they don't go disappearing for no reason. They show up, but nobody's listening. Still to this day, still this is happening. We had a family that went and said, hey, our family member's missing. And they said, no, no, they're not. And then sadly, they found them a week later. And this happened in our community just within this last year. Nothing has changed. So here, we decided to do this on February 14th to follow suits with our brothers and sisters in Vancouver. Nationally, there have been over 1,700 confirmed deaths of murdered Indigenous women. The YWCA, along with the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, launched their very first Valentine's Day campaign today. The initiative is called Love a Shelter. It's meant to bring awareness to ongoing violence against women, gender minorities, and to recognize the staff who work at shelters across the province. Nine different shelters in Alberta took part in the campaign, and an official with the YWCA explains why this was launched on Valentine's Day. Sure, Valentine's Day is a, it's a tough day for a lot of people. It can either be really sentimental, it can be really impactful, it can also be triggering for a lot of women and people that are in shelter. So it's important for us to recognize that, you know, it doesn't have to be one of those days where, you know, you go out for dinner and you celebrate and buy gifts. It's just recognizing that, you know, there's a lot of love that comes from working in shelter and there's a lot of love expressed to the people that we try to provide services to. So we just wanted to kind of have a way to give back and have the community reach out and thank these wonderful employees for all that they do for us. So Different schools across the city participated in today's launch by making Valentine's Day cards. Love is in the air for Valentine's Day, and with it comes lots of flowers and chocolates. But not everything is positive for those trying to find love online. According to the Better Business Bureau, romance scams are on the rise during Valentine's Day. Projections by the National Retail Federation say this year's Valentine's Day will see consumer spending reach nearly $26 billion. Now, staff with the Better Business Bureau told us there are a few red flags to watch out for if you're hoping for Cupid's arrow to land true. These include if the relationship is moving fast, you never meet in person, and if they start to ask for money. The Southern Alberta K-9 First Aid will be holding a training session this weekend for anyone interested in learning how to perform CPR on their dog. The group travels across the country teaching first aid. They cover everything from health and prevention to how to stop bleeding. Now, the owner, Lisa Krieger, says these types of training sessions are very important and many are unsure of how to save a dog's life. Things that you didn't think would happen on a regular basis happen all the time. So we have people that reach out to us after they've taken our course and they have their dog choking on food and they have to do the abdominal thrusts on them. Or I've had somebody that's taken our class and she's a groomer and she was grooming um, a dog that she had in and the dog went into cardiac arrest because of the blow dryer. And she said, had I not taken your course um, yesterday, I probably wouldn't save the dog today. That was one cute puppy dog. More information on the class is available on the company's website. If you take a drive by the small town of Cardston, chances are you'll notice a huge historic landmark. The Cardston Alberta Temple is celebrating its 100th anniversary. A special dedication will take place later this summer. Video journalist Micah Quinn chatted with the Cardston and District Historical Society about the long and storied history of the building. I've even heard of people traveling from Nova Scotia to come here on bus. The Cardston Alberta Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the first Mormon temple to be built outside of the United States. Blaine Jensen, the president of the Cardston and District Historical Society, says over 360,000 tons of granite had to be quarried and then brought by rail into southern Alberta to build the temple. What was originally meant to take one year to build would last a decade instead from 1913 
1923. Part of that was because of lack of funds. Part of it was also World War I that uh, slowed the progress of it. The church's philosophy was that they weren't going to open anything until it was all paid for. On August 23rd of 1923, the temple was officially dedicated. At first, it was 32,000 square feet, and now it has increased to approximately 87,000. The cost to build the temple was originally estimated at $100,000, but came in at just over 750000 once it was finished. In 1992, the temple was officially declared a National Historic Site. There were several innovations that were done in this temple that allowed for the international expansion. Right now, the church has either under construction, planned, or announced over 300 temples. A four-day pageant will also be held at the temple from August 23rd to the 26th to celebrate its centennial year. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. An incredible piece of architecture, wow. The final numbers have been tallied for the Badges versus Bolts charity hockey game. The two teams raised just under $4,600 for the Jack 80 Cancer Center here in Lethbridge. The Bolts squeezed out a very close 7-6 win in a shootout. Officials with the teams told us that the event is an annual game that pits members of the Lethbridge Lightning versus the Badges, who are made up mostly of emergency services personnel from our city. Fentanyl is a highly addictive substance that's causing a lot of issues across Canada and the U.S. The synthetic is up to 100 times more potent than morphine and kills thousands of people each and every month. Now that's according to Michael W. Brown, who's a former special agent with the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. He explains why cartels even lace their supply with the deadly drug, even when it kills so many of their customers. More than two grams is enough to kill an individual. So what the cartels are doing, they understand the, the pharmacology of fentanyl, the addictive quality of fentanyl. And of course, cartels are in business to make money by selling addiction. So if they can get customers to use a product that is more addictive, they can make more money. And they understand that there's a period of adjustment where traditional heroin users will transition to fentanyl. And in that period of adjustment, people will die, maybe 100,000, maybe 200,000, but they will gain another 400,000 customers. So for the cartels, it's simply the cost of doing business. Brown will also talk about why the cartels are looking to Canada for fentanyl distribution and why our country is becoming a safe haven for drug lords. That interview with BCN's Navide is coming up later in our program. Well, a lot of the snow we received in Lethbridge should be melting again soon. More of those Chinook winds are on the way. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Well, the average high for this time of year is plus two degrees here in Lethbridge. We're a little below that on Tuesday. Jeanette Roche is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, first of all, happy Valentine's Day. And the good news is a warming trend is on the way. So once again, we'll be back above our seasonal values. And happy Valentine's Day to you as well. Uh, nothing like a nice warming trend to warm our hearts for Valentine's Day, that's for sure, as we are going to be seeing that this week with the pluses. We just got to get through Wednesday, uh, high of zero. And then after that, uh, high of six degrees for both Thursday and Friday. Plenty of sunshine as well. Clear skies expected on Saturday with a high of five degrees. Eight degrees the high on a Sunday with a mix of sun and cloud. And then we got back to the flurries expected on Monday with a high of only minus five. So the almanac tells us the average high for this time of year is two degrees average low minus 11 our warm day on this valentine's day the record was back in 1971 it was 13 degrees and the chilliest valentine's day was minus 32 that was back in 1978 sun rose this morning at 7 44 sunset at 5 47 so we're now sitting at more than 10 hours of daylight 10 hours and three minutes to be exact okay on the west coast victoria six degrees the high with sun and cloud there. Partly cloudy skies also expected in Vancouver tomorrow. Six degrees the high there as well. Minus six in Edmonton. Edmonton seeing a chance of flurries and clear skies expected tomorrow in Calgary with a high of minus one. As we get over to the rest of the prairies, we're seeing uh, some increasing cloud coverage in Saskatoon. Minus 13 the high. We're also going to see some flurries beginning in the afternoon. Regina seeing a high of minus 11. Minus 15 the high in Winnipeg uh, with increasing clouds there as well. As we get to the central part 
part of the country. We are seeing uh, more rainfall there than snow. So 14 degrees is the high in Toronto. Going to be seeing periods of rain. Rain also expected tomorrow in Ottawa. High of 10 degrees. Very nice and warm. 7 degrees the high in Montreal. Also expecting some showers there as we get to uh, Atlantic Canada. Looking at the Maritimes here. 6 degrees the high. Fredericton also seeing some showers. Uh, partly cloudy skies in Halifax tomorrow. 4 degrees the high there. 4 and high in Charlottetown. Now, St. John's, Newfoundland, we are looking at a winter storm warning in effect through a Wednesday. We could see being, be seeing ice pellets, snow uh, mixed with all kinds. I mean, we're looking at wind warnings as well, 80 to 100 kilometer per hour winds and heavy snowfall, 35 to 40 centimeters in certain parts around the St. John's vicinity. So they're sort of bracing for that winter storm right there. And there you go. That is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet, while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. WestJet is expanding routes between Alberta's capital and destinations of both Canada and the U.S. The Calgary-based airline says it's adding new non-stop service from Edmonton to Minneapolis and Seattle as part of its 2023 summer schedule. It has also announced new routes to London, Ontario, Moncton, New Brunswick, and Charlottetown, PEI. It is also resuming non-stop service to Ottawa and Montreal, along with Nanaimo and Penticton, B.C. WestJet says the new routes will further strengthen its east-to-west connectivity. Imperial Oil says it has filed a plan for the interim cleanup of more than 5,000 cubic meters of tailings that overflowed from one of its tailings dams at its curl site north of Fort McMurray. A spokesperson for the oil sands giant says the company has sent a cleanup plan to the Alberta Energy Regulator. No new information about the massive spill and seepage event has been released by the company or the regulator. But last week's order required Imperial's plan to include ways to stop and clean up the leak along with a study of how it impacted wildlife. A German court has rejected a Greenpeace lawsuit against Volkswagen. The suit aimed to force the automaker to stop selling vehicles with combustion engines by the year 2030. However, the court ruled that VW was acting within the law. The civil case echoes several other lawsuits brought by climate campaigners, including one against BMW that was dismissed last week. Greenpeace says it plans to appeal. The futuristic city-state of Dubai is again reaffirming its plans for the takeoff of flying taxi cabs. It offered its firmest details yet for a pledged launch by the year 2026. Since 2017, the commercial capital of the United Arab Emirates has offered promises to launch flying cabs in the city, already home to the world's tallest building and other architectural wonders. Dubai government officials are focusing on the electric flying taxi by Joby Aviation, a Santa Cruz, California-based company. The firm said it was exploring the possibility. Now is a look at today's markets. The TSX was up two points on the day to finish at 20,704. The Dow Jones was down 156 points to 34,089. The S&P 500 was down one point on the day to 4136. And the NASDAQ was up 68 points to 11,960. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.08 to 7906 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 16 cents to 257 US. Gold was up three cents to 1854.34 U.S. an ounce, and silver was even on the day at 21.85 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.06 per bushel, barley's at 9.14, canola's at 18.32, and corn is at $11.23 per bushel. Live cattle were down 13 cents to 162.15. Feeder cattle March contract was down 55 cents to 186.65 and lean hogs were down 15 cents to 75.68. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 74.98 US. Recapping one of our top stories, police have identified the 43-year-old suspect behind a deadly shooting at Michigan State University on Monday night. They say Anthony McRae opened fire inside of an academic building and the student union, killing three students and injuring five others. Police confronted McRae off campus before he allegedly killed himself. 
Coming up, we're going to chat with a former special agent, Michael W. Brown, who worked with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. Mr. Brown explains why drug cartels are lacing their supplies with a deadly drug, even when it kills so many of their paying customers. That interview with BCN's Naveen Day is on deck. If you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. With Canada and the U.S. still in the grips of a decades-old opioid epidemic, the crisis has deepened in recent years with the introduction of fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that is up to 100 times more potent than morphine. It is a driving force behind countless overdose deaths per year, and law enforcement agencies and officers face many challenges when it comes to controlling the synthetic. Joining me to discuss these challenges in more detail is Michael W. Brown. He is the Global Director of Counter-Narcotics Interdiction Partnerships at Rigaku Analytical Devices. He has a distinguished career spanning more than 30 years as a special agent for the Drug Enforcement Administration. Most recently, he was the DEA Headquarters Staff Coordinator for the Office of Foreign Operations for the Middle East, Europe, Afghanistan and India. He also spent 10 years in Pakistan as a special advisor to the U.S. Embassy on various law enforcement issues. Michael, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And wow, what a distinguished career you have, Michael. So our city, Lethbridge, Alberta, is plagued with an opioid crisis, as many cities are, and it contributes to many other issues, including crime and homelessness. What kind of stats can you give us on fentanyl use and deaths associated with its use in Canada? Well, I can tell you that the, the association within American cities, which are exhibiting or going through the same situations in Alberta, is staggering. I think nationally in the U.S., we're losing some 300 individuals a day wow. related to fentanyl overdoses. That's 2,100 a week, and that's about 8,000 a month. And those numbers are anticipated to go up dramatically if something is not done to stem what I call the center of gravity of fentanyl precursor chemicals and production in Mexico. And of course, the United States and Canada are attached to the hip in many ways, economically, culturally, socially. And of course, the crime, criminal, the criminality that we share is exactly the same. Now, many people may be wondering, if fentanyl is so deadly, why are drug dealers using it to lace illicit drugs? Like, aren't they concerned about potentially harming or killing their paying customers? Well, here's the interesting thing about fentanyl. It's a Schedule II controlled narcotic, and it's used as for severe pain medicine within cancer patients. So used appropriately, it, it saves many lives. But when the cartels, are the manner in which they are using it, right, they're just mixing it with lacing it with heroin and with other narcotics, say methamphetamine or cocaine, for example. But the potency of fentanyl is extremely strong. As you, as you mentioned earlier, it's 100 times more potent than heroin. So really, more than two grams is enough to kill an individual. So what wow. the cartels are doing, they understand the, the pharmacology of fentanyl, the addictive quality of fentanyl. And of course, cartels are in business to make money by selling addiction. So if they can get customers to use a product that is more addictive, they can make more money. And they understand that there's a period of adjustment where traditional heroin users will transition to fentanyl. And in that period of adjustment, People will die, maybe 100,000, maybe 200,000, but they will gain another 400,000 customers. So for the cartels, it's simply the cost of doing business. Wow. So they aren't really trying to kill people. They're looking, for, they're, they're looking to, to expand the addiction. And, uh, and I guess like those who, who die off, that's, you're, like you're saying, it's just the cost of doing business. That's shocking. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's murder with intent, but it's certainly a manslaughter where they know the act that they're doing will most likely cause or have a high probability of causing an individual to have an overdose reaction, therefore causing his death. So certainly they have knowledge that what they're doing could and is in many cases resulting in, in a homicide. But again, their primary objective is to make a profit. And, and historically, the cartels have never had a problem killing people with intent. So that's within their wheelhouse. I mean, these are, these are very dangerous organizations who, whose only motive is to make a profit and human cost. Now, what about prescription opioids? Because you touched on that a little bit earlier about how they, how they, they do have medicinal qualities. But do you feel that they may also be contributing to the crisis? 
Well, I mean, you have to go back to 2012 to 2010 when the opioid crisis really started associated with Purdue Pharma and OxyContin, uh, America's attempt to manage pain. Well, it got a little out of control, you could say, and then Americans became addicted to OxyContin because of overprescriptions. And I won't get into the whole Purdue Pharma litigation situation, but that was kind of the epicenter, which started what I consider to be America's non-traditional drug user epidemic, right? These are individuals that don't historically take cocaine, methamphetamine, or hard narcotics. They became addicted to prescription pills, primarily OxyContin. And once that began to get regulated, the OxyContin got cut off. But people at that point were already addicted, and then they turned to street heroin to feel that pain relief. Then they became addicted to heroin. And then over the next couple of years, fentanyl slipped into that heroin supply line and then created even a greater addiction, resulting in a high number of overdose deaths. Now, uh, many people feel that that law enforcement officers are losing the battle against fentanyl. And I've heard that uh, many times uh, here in Lethbridge. What is your opinion on this? You know, I'm often asked that question. And I would say law enforcement is not losing the battle against drug trafficking with with working in within the parameters that they have. Like when I work for DEA, we have a legal code. We have a justice system that allows us to do certain things. And DEA, state and local law enforcement agencies are doing everything within their authorization to combat drug trafficking. But here's the thing, our authority, our law enforcement authority stops at the US-Mexican border. There are no large scale laboratories in the United States. There's no cartel precursor fentanyl distribution supply chain. There's no roving gangs of, of cartel hitmen killing and cutting heads off of police officers. This is all occurring in Mexico, which is the center of gravity. And the U.S. does not simply have the capability to go into Mexico and manage or degrade what I call the center of gravity, which is where the problem of fentanyl distribution, the metastasization of fentanyl, of the fentanyl crisis is now growing and spreading into America and therefore into Canada. And what kind of work is the U.S. government doing with, uh, with the, the Mexico government to, to work together on this issue? Well, I mean, there is a bilateral relationship. There is a DEA office in Mexico. But as you know, the relationship between Mexico and the United States is probably not at its best. Um, starting back with the arrest of General Sanfuego, who was the Mexican de uh, Defense Secretary, the Secretary of Defense for the military. He was arrested and charged on drug trafficking charges in the United States. Mexico threatened the United States to close down the embassy kicked the EA out unless he was released. So uh, the decision was made to release him. He was a major crime figure associated with the Sinaloa cartel. So that's the, that's, the, that's the relationship the U.S. has with Mexico. It's very tenuous. And what we're seeing now in Mexico is, is the expansion of Mexican cartels in an attempt to basically take over the state, right? So for years of, of what I would call cooperative, corruptive relationship with the government, has now come to an impasse where the cartels feel that they can be in control. And this creates a, an even larger problem than we have in the United States. And what about Canada? Where, where is Canada getting its fentanyl supply from? Is that also coming up from Mexico? Where's the interesting thing? All the trafficking gangs that operate in the United States operate in Canada. You have the Hells Angels, Latin Kings, you have the Zetas, um, you have the Five Families, the Italian Mafia. And recently there was a large shipment of fentanyl um, that was sent from Canada to Australia. So what the cartels are doing now, they're establishing, I believe it was uh, a shipment was sent to Sydney, Australia. But what the cartels are doing, they're establishing Canada as a central international hub for fentanyl distribution because it's easier to ship it from Canada to Australia as opposed from Mexico to Australia. So Canada has become this safe haven for the expansion of cartels like Sinaloa and the Jalisco New Generation in the international distribution of fentanyl, and that creates a significant problem for Canada. Absolutely. So, so what does Canada need to do to, to nip this in the bud, really? Well, I mean, continue to do what they're doing, and that's working with U.S. officials, working with Canadian officials, and developing you know, intelligence and targeting these cartels um, before they can establish a foothold uh, and expand their narcotic trafficking activities. Because once that foothold gets established, it becomes very difficult to break. And that's what we're dealing with here in the United States. The cartels have well-established, entrenched drug distribution networks across the entire country. It's almost virtually impossible to ferret out all of those organizational structures 
um, to reduce the amount of fentanyl being distributed in this country. What kinds of risks do officers face when they're exposed to fentanyl during, say, a traffic stop or a house search? Like, how do they protect themselves? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I reflect back on my career with DEA. When we do a search warrant, we find, say, a kilogram of heroin. I would typically cut it open with a knife, take a little bit of the powder out, and put it into a, a reagent test kit. That process, I had heroin dust all over me, my hands, my clothes, everywhere. Today, if that was a kilo of fentanyl, I run the risk of exposure by either inhaling it or getting it into my eyes, an open cut perhaps, my nasal passages, at which point the officer is at great risk for potential overdose. In my opinion, officers now dealing with potential drug situations, search warrants or vehicle inspections are dealing with what I call a hazmat situation. They can no longer look at it as routine because routine and making mistakes can get you killed. So it's not like the movies where, uh, where a, a, an officer will dip his finger into like some cocaine, put it on his tongue like, that's cocaine. That's not, that's not true, is it? That, that was never a good idea to begin with, but it's certainly not. It's the worst idea now, definitely. And how are officers able to identify a narcotic when they find a substance that looks suspicious? You touched on this a little bit earlier. Well, it's, it's, officers have a number of tools they can use. They, they have the fentanyl test kits that are out there now. There are the marquee reagent test kits that test for a number of narcotics. But the problem, in my opinion, with those, those test measures is the officer has to expose him or herself to the actual fentanyl powder. Now, there's a lot of new technology out there referred to as Raman spectroscopy. And that's basically a handheld laser that suits a light beam into the substance. It heats it up. The molecules get heated up and they vibrate. That vibration causes a, it's like a digital fingerprint. The software can then identify that substance as fentanyl, heroin, or cocaine, or a number of other narcotics, all without having to expose the officer to that substance. So I think in the future moving forward, uh, hopefully we'll see more law enforcement officers and departments moving towards having every officer having a, a Raman spectroscopy laser, handheld laser as part of his or her toolkit. And with that portable t technology, um, is that enough evidence to, uh, to give an officer the probable cause needed to arrest and charge a suspect? Well, that's a great point also because the use of technology really removes the, the human error aspect. So an officer is doing what we call presumptive analysis using a Raman spectroscopy. It's a, it's a, it's a computer-generated analytical response within a couple of seconds. And that can be used to apply for search warrants or further probable cause for a search or arrest, really removing the, the possibility of human error or the device, in, in the case of a fentanyl test strip, giving you a false negative uh, reaction. Now, the ongoing crisis can be felt hard in the city where we're coming to you from, which is Lethbridge, Alberta. To address this issue, there has been support for a full-time supervised consumption site, or an SCS, as we call it here. We had a provincially funded SCS from February of 2018 to August of 2020, and it was replaced then by a mobile unit later on. Some are asking for a fully equipped, fully equipped SCS to return as they feel that harm reduction is vital to saving lives. What are your thoughts on this? You know, this is a this is a major major conversation we're having in the United States. There are pros and cons. I think some of the some of the pros are harm reduction and utilizing safe injection sites or a quick immediate fix to save an individual from an overdose. Right? We want to save lives, but the downside of that is we are enabling long term drug addiction by providing individuals a place a safe place to use narcotics. Now, anyone who understands the pharmacology of drug addiction. You're using heroin, you have to inject or re-up at least two to three times a day. Wow. Fentanyl, fentanyl, on the other hand, will get you up in seconds and will last for 30 seconds. Typical fentanyl substance users have to re-up at least five to six times a day. Wow. So let's say you have a mobile unit. They're just going to be parked in front of somebody's house all day long, supplying safe supply or supplying narcotics that can be utilized, right? And then the additional issue with that is your cartels, they love this idea because now you're, you're guaranteeing a lifetime supply of customers by one, decriminalizing or legalizing personal use narcotics, that's 2.5 grams or less, and the continued use and the continued rehabilitation and recidivism rate of those that you're trying to save. So I think in the very, very short term, it can save lives, 
but we should not stop and say we found a solution in safe site injection locations. Well, that's all the time we have for today, Michael, but we really appreciate having you on today. No worries. Pleasure to be here. Michael W. Brown is the Global Director of Counter-Narcotics Interdiction at Rigaku Analytic Devices and a former special agent with the United States DEA. Perhaps one of the unintended consequences of the COVID lockdowns and mandates has been Alberta parents seeking to take a more active role in the education of their children. Wednesday evening in the riding of West Lethbridge, the organization Parents for Choice in Education is hosting an event to hear concerns from parents and advocate for more parental involvement in education. So to talk more about the desires that parents have for their child's education, we welcome John Hilton O'Brien, the Executive Director of Parents for Choice in Education. John, good to have you on today. Thank you, Jeanette. It's nice to be here. Oh, thank you. You too. Okay, so John, maybe give us a brief overview of Parents for Choice in Education. What is it exactly? So Parents for Choice in Education is an Alberta-based nonprofit organization advocating for an excellent, quality-oriented, choice-driven education system that recognizes parental authority. We figure that children don't come one size fits all, and education shouldn't either. We've been around for about 10 years now. 10 years. Okay, that's a while. That's long before the pandemic. Absolutely. So why did you join Parents for Choice in Education? What was in it for you? You're the executive director. Were you, you're not the founder of it though, right? I am one of the founders of it as well. And we saw a number of the issues that we're seeing these days come up. There were some significant challenges both to parental authority and to the idea of choice in education coming up in Alberta at the time. And we thought we should probably mobilize to do something about it. Okay, so enter the uh, the organization. <laughs> Precisely. Okay, so why do you feel that choice and education will create a better education environment or a better education experience for Alberta students? Well, if you go to our website at parentchoice.ca, you'll find a number of research documents because research is one of the things we do. And so over the course of eight years, choice in education, especially the private schools and homeschooling, saved the province about $1.9 billion, that's with a B. So we've saved a lot of money on it, but also it's allowed us to customize the experience of education for children. Now, I myself uh, grew up going to school in a special program. I was part of the first cohort that went through the International Baccalaureate Program in Calgary back oh, in the 80s. Wow. And in fact, uh, given that I've been watching my grades decline through junior high school through 10th grade, I would have to say that the International Baccalaureate Program, which let me change schools, get into uh, an environment that suited me much better, saved my educational career. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, how, did it, how did it save your educational career? What, what did it do well, exactly? Options were very narrow in the program that I was going to. Um, I experienced bullying personally. Um, it was a very difficult thing to go through. And the uh, IB program allowed them to offer programs that matched my interests and also students with similar interests. So both socially and educationally specific, it was a much better choice for me. Yeah, it sounds like it, absolutely. And of course, we've seen statistics that show that when kids move to you know, alternative models of education that they excel and do better as learning, just better at learning, just as you were sort of you know, mentioning there. So in your mind, John, what is the payoff for parents in Lethbridge and beyond when they have a choice in education? Well, the first payoff is simply better results for children. You get a better education that's tailored to the way that a child learns. And you get a certain amount of power as a parent to be able to make sure that the child is learning what's best for him or her, and that you have some connection to what's going on in your child's education. Okay, so John, are we talking then, uh, so this alternative 
schooling? Would it be these uh, micro schools? Would it be homeschooling? What, how, what does this look there's like a, exactly? There's a whole range of educational options in Alberta. We have our public schools. We have the separate school system, usually Catholic schools. We also have charter schools. Now, a charter school is run by a not-for-profit society of some sort. It doesn't charge tuition, and it takes anyone who comes. And a charter school focuses on a particular idea. So, for instance, in Calgary, we have Calgary STEM Academy that just started and Calgary Classical Academy. So those are two sorts of charter schools, and they are fully funded. We also have three grades of private schools from completely unfunded to the much more common fully accredited private school, which gets about 70% of funding, but no capital funding. And we have home education, which is divided into a couple of types. There's homeschooling that's done by notification only of the parents. So the parents are completely doing everything to working through an educational authority, which helps to supervise that and make sure they're on the right track. And there's even such a thing as shared responsibility. So home educating parents can arrange to have one or two courses done by a local school, partly because we can't all afford to buy chemistry labs in our basement. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned sort of dollars there. So maybe can you talk about the financial case for dollars being able to follow a student to a school of a, the parent's choice? Well, a few years ago, we commissioned a report uh, that was done by Mark Milkey primarily and another author, uh, Paige McPherson. And what they showed was that Alberta had saved about 1.8, sorry, one point close to $1.9 billion on doing home education and private schools over an eight year period in Alberta. It's a considerable savings. But one of the things that sometimes gets uh, touted around as a, a bit of a canard by people who fancy themselves advocates for public education is the idea that private schools are for rich people only. They're not actually. Most people sending their kids to private schools are tradespeople. They're middle class people who simply want to have more involvement in their children's education and want to make sure it's done well. Yes, so there's a financial commitment, but it's not restricted to the wealthy. Yeah. No, don't, that, I mean, that's really, that's good to hear. Uh, one request that we've heard from public school teachers is that they request smaller class sizes. Can, so can you maybe talk about how choice and school funding vouchers benefit parents, teachers, and students? Well, one of the key problems in education is, of course, funding. And the funding model we have right now is called the weighted moving average. Before the weighted moving average, we funded schools based on butts and seats in September. Nowadays, however, it's only half the butts and seats this September, 30% from last year, 20% from the year before. And that means that growing schools are penalized under the current formula. And that's why it often seems that growing schools, particularly in places like Lethbridge and Calgary, are having too large of classroom sizes. The funding model does make it so that schools that are shrinking, such as some rural areas, don't have to suddenly fire teachers you know, on October 1st or anything, but it provides a significant challenge. So this past year, I was successful in advocating to the minister and they came up with a supplementary grant to help support growing schools. But the amounts that they chose to put in were not sufficient really to mitigate some of the class size problems we're having. So we're hoping to see more results from the ministry in that direction over the coming year or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's exactly. Um, can this maybe help students who might maybe fall through the cracks in a public school system? Um, how that, maybe talk about how that choice in education could help a student like that. Well, that is the very best people that it's for. 
So every public school system and Catholic school system also tries to have their own special programs within the schools. So in Strathmore, for instance, and I think in Lethbridge, there is a an organization called Storefront School. So you may get some kids who are falling through the cracks go to that system, but it's still not appropriate for everyone. So you'll find parents who have a strong religious interest in the family. And so they'll send their children to a private school that's religiously based. So for instance, you will find a variety of Christian schools across Alberta. And occasionally you'll find something like a Sikh school as exists in Edmonton, done as a private school, which actually convinced the public system there to imitate it, I'm told. So you'll get specialty education like that. So it really helps with the children of immigrants in particular, letting them keep uh, contact with their, fam with their family's traditions. And it also speaks to the particular interest of a child. When you have a child who's really interested in maths and sciences, there's not a lot of outlet for that in the regular school system. But a STEM academy makes an enormous difference in their lives. Yeah, 100%. Uh, John, how do you think your organization can create change in school choice? Well, there's four things that we actually do. One of them is consciousness raising, such as my uh, visit to Lethbridge tomorrow. Um, we also do some exploration of issues through research. If you go through our site, you'll find columns that we've published as well that uh, bring some of that research to the fore in a, a more digestible format. We do training. So we'll equip parents to advocate for themselves because you often need to advocate for your child. And we'll even train people to run for school board trustee as we did in the last election. And we do a significant amount of advocacy to the government as on the funding issue. So that's four ways that Parents for Choice in Education helps to make a difference there. Okay, no, excellent. Um, so is this desire for choice based on religious beliefs or have you found that parents in general are looking for these better options when it comes to quality of education? Lots of parents are looking for for uh, some sort of choice. And for a few of them, it's due to some sort of religious commitment. Usually though, it doesn't cash out to a religious commitment that says we must home educate. It's simply a commitment to doing better for your children that is embedded in your religion. And over COVID, we did a lot of education from the home, even in the public schools. And many parents became aware of the quality of their children's education for the first time, and lots were dissatisfied. Many of us had an image of education in our minds that was much grander than we were seeing our children get. And so lots and lots of parents have set out to improve the lot of their children's education. And choice is the thing that allows you to do it. It forms the the only basis for getting involved in your children's education. Because if you can't choose to go to a different school, there's no negotiation available, right? It is uh, the school's way or the highway. And so choice is what allows parents to be involved in education. Without it, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, John, you're having an event in Lethbridge this week. What will you be be discussing at the event, what's going to be going on there? I'll probably be discussing the, basically the pillars of education reform mostly. I'll be talking about funding, curriculum reform, educational choice, and challenges to parental authority, such as the secrecy policies that many schools, including those in Lethbridge, have uh, to do with children. Okay, uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Oh very well the, For historical reasons, many of our school boards in Alberta have a policy that says if your child is involved in a religious organization, 
or they're involved in a club that discusses sexual or gender issues. They're not allowed to tell the parents under any circumstances, even if the child's involvement is invo uh, touches on mental health issues that can be quite dangerous, which means that we're not seeing necessarily referrals for appropriate medical services. At the same time, we've discovered that Alberta has a pediatric gender identity clinic, which offers services up to and including, apparently, um, surgery. And they were... I've, I've done a little research on that too, John, and I don't think that there's any doctor that would perform surgery on a child without parental consent. Absolutely. However, some documents came to light recently with the center explaining that folks, um, we will take initial referrals for children from your school. And that can be done without parental consent, at least in the early stage. Right. And so those documents are concerning and we hope that that situation will be rectified very rapidly. Yeah, I, I think- So parents need to be uh, very concerned about that yeah. and to speak up to make sure the situation is addressed properly. So this, this sort of thing creeps in on us and we have to take prompt action to make sure that the right thing is done. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much, John, for speaking to us today about choice and education. And by the way, you are speaking Wednesday evening at CASA between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m.? That's right. Okay. Thanks for coming on today, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks so much for watching.